All right. And also, I just heard a rumble of thunder. And, uh, and so knowing this area and how connectivity may be, if we happen to lose connectivity, uh, we will go ahead, as I just mentioned, we have everybody's email address. We can send this presentation and recording from our earlier session we did at 11 o'clock this morning. And um, someone on the team will go ahead and reach out to you and, and connect with you that way. But let's hope we get through this and Mother Nature's on our side. So with that, Dan, I'm gonna send it on over to you. Hey, Karen, thanks a lot. Uh, welcome everyone, glad you could join us tonight. We did one this afternoon and it was fun and hopefully informative for you. Karen mentioned that we're a little less formal tonight. I, I haven't had a tie on in three months, which is fantastic. Um, so I hope you don't mind the in informality. Um, my job, I guess, is just to do a little intro. Um, the firm is the four lawyers. My sister is my law partner, Michelle Bineski. And we have two associate attorneys, Brandon Wallaka and Aaron Nunes, who is one of the speakers today with us. And um, we specialize in estate planning and elder law. Most, most people who get around to their estate planning are seniors. So we do a lot of elder law. And uh, Michelle and I are SELAs, which is a certified elder law attorney. There are 25 in Massachusetts. You have to pass a national exam with a, with a traditionally low pass rate. Get six attorneys to write a peer review about you submit your documentation, and then you're a SELA. So we're happy to be on that list. Um, a little bit more about us in just a second, but um, I just wanted to mention how we got into this, which is uh, my grandmother. I actually have a cousin on the call tonight, uh, so he'll know her. Uh, Jermaine Serpernant is my, was my grandmother and my dad's mom, and uh, she was diagnosed with dementia about at age 82, 83, and she um, suffered through that for six years before she passed. So it was that process and that learning curve that had my dad, who, who started the practice, uh, really turn this into a specialty in elder law. And uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons we're in this today. And I just wanted to introduce Erin. Uh, Noons, and maybe you could say a little bit about what motivates you to do this uh, practice. Absolutely. Um, so I've, I've been with the firm now for 16 years, and I started out as a paralegal, uh, and I did that job for 10 years. And, you know, during that time, I really uh, loved what we did and, and loved the people that we ser served and saw the value that it, it brought to them. And I wanted to be able to do more of that. Um, so I went to law school at night and worked for the firm during that time. And uh, now I've been practicing as an attorney uh, for just about six years. Um, personally, I am a mom with young kids. I have a son who's three and a half and, and twin daughters who are a year and a half. So it's really important to me in this job to help other families with minor kids to make sure that if something were to happen to them, that they have planning in place to, to support their kids and make sure that they're well taken care of. Um, in addition to that, um, through my work at the firm, I've worked with a lot of families on mass health planning. So helping their loved ones uh, get quality care and, and protect assets and Navigate, uh, navigate the labyrinth of, of mass health regulations that are in place. Um, and that's, that's really important work to me uh, because those families are, are going through a difficult time and it, it's emotional. Um, so it means a lot to be able to, to guide them and provide support to them while they, while they work through that. And you do a great job. Thank you. So I think we have the next slide Oh, or this is it. Well, I just wanted to talk for a second about um, Michelle and I are both on Boston Magazine's list of super lawyers, which is 5% or less of the attorneys who, who do this stuff. And Brandon and Aaron, our associate attorneys, are on the list of rising stars on Boston Magazine, in Boston Magazine. So very proud of them and, and uh, they're doing a great job. Michelle has authored a book or is co-author of a book, Protecting Your Family. And I'm a past president of Mass NALA. Mass NALA is the Massachusetts chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, largest chapter in the country. So it really keeps our head in the game as far as 
what the government's doing, what um, what uh, the judges are doing with with these things. Um, so j that's just a little bit about about us and how we specialize. Aaron, um, I think we have a a polling issue, but maybe you could talk about our offices for a second. Sure. Uh, we have three physical locations. We have an office in downtown New Bedford, one in Easton, and one in Hyannis. Um, if you have an opportunity to visit us at one of those offices, you know, please know that we're taking all of the, the recommended precautions that are in place right now uh, with social distancing and, and wearing masks and making sure that we're sanitizing um, those locations for both your safety as, as well as that of our staff. Um, to, to be able to continue to really serve um, our clients well, we're also offering uh, phone consultations for folks um, or virtual um, through Zoom or some other program like this where we can meet over the computer to, to talk about your, your goals and your planning opportunities. Under, under kind of normal circumstances, um, we also recognize that not everyone is in a position to come to one of our offices you know, maybe because of a physical limitation that they may have. So we regularly will meet with people, you know, in their home, in the assisted living, even in the hospital, um, if need be. And I know that there are restrictions in place um, for that right now, but, you know, certainly um, we'll get back to that in the future, I think, at some point. Yeah, I, I, um, I recently had a case during COVID where we had a signing at the senior's house and we had to be very careful. So they had masks on. I was standing on their front porch. I had a mask on. We both, we all had gloves on. And I would, we had reviewed the documents beforehand and I was taping it on my phone because the witnesses needed to witness virtually. And I would put the documents on their front mat and they would open the door, pick them up, bring them back inside. And I would witness them signing and they'd put them back on the, on the front steps. So you know, whatever we have to do to be safe and, and get the plan done, we're happy to do. Right. right. So we're just gonna spend a, a couple of slides talking about um, the who in this program. You know, who is it, in, is it important for to have this planning in place? Uh, and then the remainder of the slides will talk about the what, you know, what documents are we referring to? Um, so those documents um, we refer to as your foundational documents, and there's five of them really. Your healthcare proxy, your HIPAA authorization, an advanced directive, a durable power of attorney, and your last will and testament. Um, so kind of imagine a scenario where you find um, that you're sick, uh, you're hospitalized, or you've lost capacity, and you can no longer uh, manage your financial affairs or make your own medical decisions. Um, you know, with the, with the outbreak of this virus, that has really kind of pushed those thoughts and those concerns to the forefront of, of people's minds. Um, and if you were to lose capacity and not have those documents in place, it could um, really put your family uh, at risk, both financially um, and the, the stress of having to go through all of that. So here we go. So we're going to start our first poll question. As I mentioned at the beginning, all of your, your answers are um, anonymous. And I said this, so Aaron just went over the five uh, documents that they'll be going over in detail. So we just want to get a sense of where everyone is right now. Um, and so I'm going to launch this. If you guys give me a heads up, do you see it okay? I do. Okay, great. So I'll go ahead and read the question just in case some, some folks might just be dialed in and can't see it on their screen. So what we're just looking to do is just to see, get a sense of the current status, as I mentioned. So if you could take a chance, this, uh, this is a multiple choice, and we're looking not only to see what documents you have, but also what the status is as to um, where you are with those documents. So we're asking, which of the documents do you currently have? And if so, what is their status? So how many folks on the line today have a health proxy, how many have a HIPAA authorization, how many do you have a directive, which also call it living will, um, durable power 
And the last one that they'll cover is the last will and testament. So again, of those, when you think of those five documents, do you have them, but they need to be updated? Do you have them, but you would like a more comprehensive plan than you currently have right now? Or perhaps you don't have any, and you would like a little bit of more information on why you need those. So um, looks like we have a couple people voted. And I did just happen to get a, your connection is unstable. So let's hope this could continue. So I'll, I'll talk fast. Let me just be quiet here. So I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results. And looks like um, a lot of folks have the healthcare proxy in, in line. Um, with the HIPAA and the advanced directives, a lot of a lot of folks already have the the um, documents, which is fantastic, and looking to have those updated um, or get a little more comprehensive plan. So I really appreciate everyone's participation. That gives again, as I mentioned, it'll give Dan and Aaron a little bit of um, guidance as they're speaking about those uh, documents and. As a reminder, there is the chat box. You can type in some questions. We are more than happy, I said we, Dan and Aaron are more than happy to, again, to be interrupted and to expand on a point that they're making to make sure that um, you're very clear on what they're presenting. So let me go ahead and with that, I believe I'm handing it over to Dan. Great, so my job right now is, is just before we get into each of the five documents and um, what they do, we thought we'd say why they were important. So if you don't have these sort of foundational documents and you, or you have them, but they're not good, <laughs> they don't have the right provisions, they don't, they don't say the right things, uh, there's lots of things that can get you in trouble. Um, for one thing, um, medical decisions, you know, healthcare proxy, for instance, is to, make, is to name someone to make medical decisions for you. So if you don't have that, we find ourselves in court all the time, even among spouses that don't have a healthcare proxy. In the, the guardianship process, which you need to go through to, to make medical decisions for someone, is uh, three or four months and costs a few thousand dollars. So uh, we don't wanna go through that delay and that cost if we don't have to. And the court may not pick who you wanted. You know, that's one of the uh, things here is to make sure that you're picking who you'd like to handle your affairs. So uh, one of your kids that you wouldn't have picked may get the job if we go to court. Uh, we want to avoid common issues like family infighting. We have very loving, caring families that just are stressed about the situation and didn't have clear guidance from mom or dad on their wishes. So there is some disagreement, honest, caring disagreement about what should happen with mom and dad. Um, we wanna be able to pr protect assets. Um, we want to make sure that we can um, move a house from dad's name to mom's name, for instance, to protect it from the cost of long-term care if we have both spouses living. So there's lots of, lots of problems that we can get into if we don't have at least foundational documents in place. Um, making it worse nowadays is COVID because if we have to go to court to do anything financially or medically, it's taking longer and the courts are open in a limited capacity. They're doing most things virtually and we're finding that it's taking a long time, longer than usual and it's it's usually a long time, but longer than usual to get things back from the court. They're just stressed and, and uh, uh, have limitations nowadays through COVID. So it's just another reason to make sure that things are in order and we don't wind up in guardianship or conservatorship. So we're now gonna go, that's the why, you know, why you should have things in place. And uh, we're now gonna get into the what, you know, the, the, the documents. I let Erin uh, take it away with regard to minor children or college children. Sure, um, so, so before I start talking about the documents themselves, I'd, I'd like to tie back just for a minute to uh, something that Karen mentioned at the beginning. And uh, that's uh, the limitations that you might find um, that you are up against if you have a child who is about to turn 18 or has recently turned 18. 
Um, you know, you might feel that, that that your child is in no way, shape, or form an adult, um, but in the eyes of the law, they are. Uh, and that means that you no longer have the right to make, um, you know, legal or medical decisions for them. Um, you don't have access to their medical information uh, unless they give you the authority to, to do so. Um, and if you've got a, a child who may be going off to college uh, and they unexpectedly get sick or have an accident, um, you know, maybe they have an underlying medical condition or they've got, you know, a really severe allergy to, to food or something else um, where there's a increased likelihood that they may find themselves in crisis. Um, you as the parent are, are very likely not going to be able to step in and, and intervene on their behalf. Um, so it's really important that for all adults, um, you know, that you have these five foundational documents in place. Um, so I'm going to turn to, you know, what the first uh, document you should have really is. And that's your healthcare proxy. So the healthcare proxy is the document where you name who you want to make your legal and finance, excuse me, um, your medical decisions for you in the event that you cannot make them for yourself. So it's a document where you uh, nominate or name a primary agent um, and then an alternate to that person in case they aren't able to fulfill their, their duties as your, your healthcare proxy. A healthcare proxy actually gets uh, activated or invoked by your physician if they find that you no longer have the capacity to make medical decisions um, for yourself that's when the person that you have named in that document will be able to kind of step into your shoes and start um, making medical decisions on your behalf. If you were to lose capacity and you didn't have a healthcare proxy in place, or um, you had just the kind of the generic healthcare proxy from the hospital that really didn't um, go into the specific powers that you're granting your agent, your loved ones may find that they have to go into court and petition a judge to become your guardian. That's who the court says gets to make your medical decisions if you don't have a good healthcare proxy in place. And as Dan was mentioning, you know, the, the delays now um, around the, the court process are, are significant and the cost of doing that is significant as well. So it's really important that you, you take this opportunity uh, to put a good healthcare proxy in place. Um, in addition to the healthcare proxy, uh, it's also really important to have a document uh, known as a HIPAA authorization. And Dan's going to talk a little bit more about what that is. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. You know, on the healthcare proxy, you mentioned those uh, standard forms at the doctor's office, and you know, I don't, I don't mean to. Um, scare people, most of the time that that standard form will do it. Um, th there are things that is not in that form, like administration of antipsychotic medication or admission to a nursing facility. Um, so if we find ourselves in those situations, we're in court to get court permission. So we'd rather have sort of a beefed up healthcare proxy. Um, but the standard form, most of the time, <laughs> will be fine. Uh, so the HIPAA release, HIPAA, if you don't know, is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It's a federal law that says doctors and hospitals can't release your information without your permission. So that's wonderful privacy law. Uh, but the problem all the time is, you know, your wife's in the hospital or your child is in the hospital and you're trying to call and find out what's going on speak to the doctors or speak with the ambulance billing company about screw up in the ambulance bill or speak with Blue Cross Blue Shield about some billing issue or coverage issue. And uh, the person on the other end of the phone says, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. You're not the patient. HIPAA laws prevent me from talking to you. And it makes a difficult situation worse. So, so one of the foundational documents, really document number two, is this HIPAA release that greases the wheels so that everyone can talk. The, the people that you name in the HIPAA release can talk. And um, we want to make sure it travels. In other words, 
all doctor's offices and hospitals will have their own HIPAA release that will say, I authorize Dr. So-and-so's office to release my records to these people. And that's great for doctor, that doctor's office. But if you wind up at Mass General or Toby Hospital or uh, Charlton Memorial or wherever, uh, it's not good there. And if you, you know, if you get rolled in instead of walking in, if you, if you lack mental capacity when you arrive, you won't be able to sign their HIPAA release. So we want, as a part of our foundational documents, a HIPAA release that travels, you know, one that will be good anywhere you go. So it really, um, we don't want to make a bad time worse, you know, crisis time more difficult. So, so that the HIPAA release is an important document. So really the, the last of the three um, documents kind of regarding your healthcare is your advanced directive. Um, sometimes that's called a personal directive or, or a living will. And that document is intended to provide guidance to the individual that you chose as your healthcare agent so that they know what your wishes are with regard to your healthcare. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, with a lot of families, that's a difficult conversation to have. And if, if you're in the role of having to make, um, you know, really important medical decisions for someone else, should they be having surgery? Should they remain on life support? Uh, that can be, you know, incredibly stressful. Um, and it, it's, it would be very helpful and valuable to be able to look to a document that someone prepared that laid out the type of end of life um, decision-making that you might be facing. It's really, um, it's really also helpful um, in families where there may be a difference of opinion. Um, you know, maybe it's a second marriage where you've, you've named your new spouse as your healthcare proxy, or uh, you have a few kids and you've named your eldest in that, that role, and they're making a decision that the others don't necessarily agree with. If they can pull that document out um, to show them that this is, this is why they've made that decision on your behalf, because you took the time um, and the opportunity to express to them in writing how you would want things to go, that can really relieve a lot of the, the stress and the, the burden that comes at such an emotional time for families. Uh, in addition to your, your health care, um, the, the health care issues that come up when you are incapacitated, you know, obviously a, another big stressor for families is how to deal with the finances. Uh, so Dan's gonna talk a little bit about the durable power of attorney and how we can use that document during that time. Right, thanks Erin. So this is document number four. Can I interrupt, on. sorry, Dan, we've got a question. So to, oh, sure. to Aaron's point, so, um, so we have a question that is saying, would the individual named literally bring these documents to the hospital to show their ability to make that decision? So, right, so we have these documents. If you go ahead and you have these documents in place, but how do the necessary people have access to them? How do people even know that they exist and then to carry out? So, I mean, it's a, it's a good idea um, for you to provide with the people that you chose as your healthcare agents with a copy of the healthcare proxy. Um, you know, there's, there's little risk of that being abused because it's not activated um, and can't be used until a doctor states that you have lost capacity. Um, so you can kind of paper the world with your healthcare proxy, um, you know, give them to your agents, give them to all of your physicians. Um, certainly if you're hospitalized, give them a copy of it. Um, when you become a client of, of our firm, we also give them to you on a flash drive with a healthcare card that you, you would put on your keychain because not, you know, you're not going to carry your healthcare documents in your back pocket. And if you're in an accident or, you know, you're traveling, you're on vacation, um, you want to have those documents handy in case something should happen. And with it on that, that little flash drive, when you get to the hospital, they can pop that right into the computer and bring those documents up and know who they need to reach out to. That's fantastic. Okay. I did not know that. That is, that is a great service. Because one of the things that um, you see that some people have their, on their phones, they have like that for emergency and you can designate 
um, you know, who to call or you can, there's, there's companies now that like the road ID where you can put like a code. So is that something that, do you work with any of those type of companies or again, the flash drive and, and, and that's what gives people the access. So again, if you're traveling um, to California, right? And so your physicians aren't there, um, but you have that information on you. That's how the necessary people would have that access to know what to do. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Great. We also have them obviously in our in our office scanned into the computer in case the client loses them and loses their flash drive. All right. Thank you. All right, Dan, back at it. Okay. So, document number four is the durable power of attorney, and that's that's arguably the most important document of the five, and it's because it it names someone you name someone of your choosing to help handle your legal and financial affairs, which is pretty broad and pretty powerful uh, document. So Aaron mentioned healthcare proxies for medical decisions. This is for legal and financial decisions. So we look for things in there like uh, powers over real estate and life insurance and retirement plans and gifting and taxes and, and all sorts of things that will enable us to implement different strategies if if someone needs care and we need to protect assets so people say my accounts are joint with my wife she can access the bank accounts i don't need a power of attorney the power of attorney is a lot more broad than uh bank accounts you know it is for instance retirement plans 401ks iras those cannot be joint they have to be in one person's name. So if we need to spend those down, move them, do whatever with them, we need a durable power of attorney or we're in court for a conservatorship taking months and costing thousands of dollars. Um, if we need to cash out life insurance or assign it to a prepaid funeral or move a house from mom to dad or any number of things that are beyond bank accounts apply for Medicaid, uh, we need a good power of attorney to do that. And they're not all the same. Uh, they are drafted very differently depending on where you get them and who's drafting them. So we want to stay on top of how they should be drafted and what powers we need. So um, it's more important nowadays with COVID-19 because of the court delays and we're seeing people get sick pretty quickly. We've had lots of clients uh, um, contract the disease and we've had a, a few clients at least pass during this process. And it's, so it's been a difficult time, but we want everyone to sort of be prepared, have their documents in place to make sure we can have options if, if um, a difficult time hits. By the way, on that, Erin, before I pass it off to you for the will, um, and, and you, you may get into this, but we want uh, you to have a backup. You know, we always want you to name a person, but we always want you to have at least one alternate. You can have multiple alternates, but if, if your spouse, for instance, is your power of attorney and you're in the same car accident with them, we don't have a backup. It's like we never did it. We're going to court with the kids for a guardianship or conservatorship. So we will always want to make sure you have a couple of agents on those documents. But Aaron, I think the next and last of the five basic documents is the will. You want to take that away? Absolutely. Um, so, so I noticed from the, the polling that uh, a lot of folks in attendance have a uh, last will and testament. And, and that's pretty common, you know, of all the documents we've talked about tonight, if you happen to have any of them, uh, it's probably the, the will. Um, I'd like to clear up a, a common misconception about the will. Um, a lot of people think that if you have a will in place, then you don't have to go through probate. But your, your will is really the instruction to the probate court as to how you want your assets to be distributed when you pass away. So what goes through your will? Any asset that you own individually when you pass away. So if yours is the only name on a bank account or a vehicle or your home, 
the way that that will ultimately get to your intended beneficiaries is through the probate court process. And again, your, your will instructs the court that this is how you want your assets to be distributed. Um, now, if you have a, a joint owner on a bank account or you have a beneficiary designation in place on your IRA or your life insurance, those assets will, will pass to the joint owner or the beneficiary outside of probate. And the provisions in your will will not govern those particular assets. Um, you you want to make sure that um, just as with the healthcare proxy and with the power of attorney, that you name uh, a primary and an alternate person to be in charge of your estate. Uh, that role used to be called an executor. Now it's called a personal representative. And you want to make sure that your your will um, has certain provisions in it. Um, you know. Does it talk about personal property distributions, you know, who you want your jewelry and your tools and, and those types of possessions to pass to? Um, certainly, if you have minor children or beneficiaries that have special needs, you want to make sure that um, the language in your, your will contemplates those situations. A really um, important thing to consider, uh, maybe as you, as you get a little bit older, is, is updating your will to include a special type of trust for your surviving spouse. So for, for married couples, if you, if you have a spouse who is sick and either already uh, might need long-term care or you think would likely need care if the healthier spouse unexpectedly passed first, um, you may come to us for guidance and, and we may help you get them qualified for mass health and, and jump through all of the hoops that are necessary to accomplish that. But if you don't update your will, and now you as the healthier spouse own all of the assets and you pass first, and your will now says, give everything to my surviving spouse outright, now you've just undone all of that good planning that you put in place to try to um, get them qualified for mass health. And it's going to be difficult then to protect those assets from the cost of long-term care. So what we might recommend in that situation is an enhanced will that includes a testamentary supplemental needs trust for your spouse. And the reason that we would do that is there's a mass health regulation that says that if you have assets that go through your will, and land in that special trust for your spouse, those assets are immediately protected from the cost of long-term care. So even if your spouse is, is already in a facility or goes into a facility the, the day after you pass away, those assets are not gonna have to be spent down um, on private paying for long-term care to the tune of 14 to $15,000 per month. Um, so it can create a a nest egg for them so that they can have the best quality of life possible, but without having to private pay uh, for long-term care. So that type of will can be a really um, great opportunity to protect assets uh, last minute if, you know, the, the quote unquote wrong spouse passes first. Uh, just a little statistic for you. 70% um, of all Americans over the age of 65 will spend some time in long-term care. So are you, you know, are you prepared for that? Um, do you have a plan in place to protect your spouse um, while managing to afford that care? Um, and that's, um, that's a significant uh, part of the planning that we do. And if that's a, a goal or concern of yours, we're happy to, to talk about a plan for that with you. Thanks, Erin. Um, we've talked mostly so far about seniors and how we protect seniors in a crisis. Uh, we also have a fair amount of clients who are young, younger, and have minor kids. You know, I fall into that category. My kids are 16, 13, and 11. So that's a whole different set of, of things to think about than my 75-year-old clients. Um, um, we want to think about, first of all, who's going to, if something happens to my wife and I, who's going to raise the kids? And that may be the same or a different person than uh, who would hold the money for my kids. 
you know, I may know some people who would be wonderful uh, guardians for my kids when I pass, but I wouldn't want them to manage the money for my kids. So uh, it, it may be the same person, but you just need to give that a little thought. So we want uh, parents of minor children to name guardians for their kids and to uh, name temporary guardians. If the guardian that you named is out of state or on vacation when something happens, maybe on vacation with you, uh, we want to name a temporary guardian so that there's no, the police won't take your kids into protective custody even for a night. We want the temporary guardian, someone local to, to hold them until the permanent guardian gets there. So with minor kids, we have what's called a kids protection plan, which is guardianships and temporary guardianships. But it's also uh, um, health proxies for the kids. You know, you naming who you'd like to make medical decisions for your kids if you cannot, if you've passed, but if you're also just on vacation and you're, you know, you name someone to approve a medication for your child or approve a surgery or procedure for your child while you're gone. Um, we also want, in a lot of cases, to give guidance to the next generation of caretakers, you know, to the guardians. We want to give them some guidance, usually on educate your thoughts on education and discipline and religion and which family members they should associate with and which they should not and things like that. So um, that all happens in the kids protection plan and it's a different set of considerations than with seniors. We may want to set up a trust for your minor kids until they're a certain age. 25 seems like a common age that we use. It's sort of our default age nowadays. So if the child is 18 and they're a sophomore in college, they're not going to get a couple hundred grand or whatever would have been not good for me to get when I was a sophomore in college. So, so things to think about if you have minor children. The point in all of this is really every plan is different. It depends on the clients and their assets and their goals and their kids and if they have disabled children and two seemingly identical clients, you know, neighbors with the same size house and the same size assets can have very different goals and priorities. So in our consultations, we're really starting with what are your goals? What are you hoping to accomplish with this? We may chime in with some issues that you're not seeing or suggestions, but it's really the first thing we want to nail down is what are your goals? And then the plan is driven from there. So it's all different. Some clients are concerned about estate tax or probate avoidance or special needs planning or protecting their kids' inheritance from a potential divorce, uh, which we can do, or keeping assets in the bloodline. You know, if my daughter passes at, even years after me, I want her kids to get her share, not necessarily her spouse. So whatever your goals are, we can craft a plan to, to accomplish those. It all sort of starts with the basic estate planning documents, these five foundational documents that we've talked about today. So, um, you know, come in, we'll, we'll set goals and make recommendations based on your goals. All right. So thanks, Dan. Thanks, Aaron. So we um, so a lot of great information. Oh, before I jump into the polling question, there is a question about um, homestead. It just says, "What about homes? What about a homestead?" Homes. Do you want to take that one, Aaron? Uh, sure. So um, uh, homes. You can put a homestead um, in place. You can record one at the Registry of Deeds. Uh, and if you if you don't, you get a basic amount of of protection from things like lawsuits. You know, if you're in a car accident and you get sued, or there's a slip and fall on your property, you know, it's it's designed so that your your home isn't isn't taken out from underneath you. Um, what a, a lot of people sometimes think is that the homestead can protect your house from the cost of long term care. Uh, and that's that's one thing that it absolutely does not protect against. So if, if you need a long-term care in a skilled nursing facility and you've got a homestead in place, it's not going to protect the property, um, you know, from a Medicaid lien or, or something like that. Right. And that, that minimum amount that Aaron mentioned, even if you don't have a homestead nowadays, is 125 grand if it's your primary residence. 
And if, but if you have a homestead, which is easy to do, it costs about a hundred bucks, um, the protection ratchets up to $500,000. And if you are uh, over the age of 62, you get what's called an elderly homestead, which means you, your spouse, you and your spouse who is over 62 can stack the homestead protection. So you can stack the two $500,000 protections for a total of a million dollars in protection in your home if, if you know, your home is big enough for that. So it's very important and easy to do and, and uh, everyone should consider it. It doesn't protect your second house or anything else. Right, it's just for your primary residence. Okay, and then there's also another question and it talks about the difference. If you could explain a little bit in further detail, either Aaron or Dan, um, the difference between a will versus a trust. So maybe I'll take a stab at that one. Um, okay. The, um, the major difference, I suppose, is a will works in the context of probate court. This cost and delay that most people are trying to avoid called probate. We inherited this multi-step system from old English law that we wind through in court called probate. Most of the time we're trying to avoid probate. The will only works in probate. So if you have, if you have probate, your will is saying where your assets go and, and who gets to pay the bills and all that stuff. A trust works outside of probate. So it's a great way, there are other ways too, but it's one great way to skip the cost and delay of probate and have assets pass immediately and privately to your kids or whoever you want to get them. Um, lots of things can be done in a trust that cannot be done in a will. Like if I want to divorce protect my kids' assets or I want to make sure it stays in the bloodline even after I've passed. Um, those, those sort of ongoing rules, rules for assets that stay in place even after I'm gone, have to be by definition done in a trust. So we do trust for things like probate avoidance, but also estate tax uh, minimization, special needs planning, um, uh, Medicaid protection, long-term care protection. There are lots of things that we do in a trust that we can't do in a will, which just divides your assets up in the probate court process. Right. And I just, I would just say in addition to that, you know, the, the trust is more private. Um, it's going to keep your beneficiary information and the, the structure and the rules that you've put in place um, for your beneficiaries private. Uh, whereas when, when you pass away, your will gets submitted to the probate court and then that becomes public record. Um, you know, really anybody who had any interest in it could go and, and pull that and look at the provisions that you had in there. So can you expand then also on the difference and um, so why then would you, set, why would you have a will versus a trust? Like what's Sounds like the trust could do a lot of things that the will does. So why do a will when you can just do the trust? No, no question for most people, a trust is gonna be better because it can do so much more and, and so much privately. But there are cases and circumstances where a will is all you need. You know, we can avoid probate by beneficiary designations. We're not concerned about estate tax or long-term care protection or divorce protection for the kids, all the things that we'd need to do in the trust. And it's just sort of a simple estate and, um, and we want to keep costs down. We may go with the will, not worry too much about probate at the end of the day when we don't have those other concerns. Okay. So Dan, earlier you had mentioned that one of, one of, one of the things that you do at the firm so well is that um, you really meet with the individual and it's, and you're going to get their goals. And so this sounds like an area where you would take the time to speak with the person at hand and really get to know the situation and be able to make that recommendation one or the other, or maybe a combination of both even. Right. Absolutely. It all starts. We get, you know, before the consultation, we have you fill out a worksheet so that I ha I can digest the overall situation before you come in and We'll, we'll talk first about goals and then we'll make recommendations from there. And the recommendation may just be a simple will. In many cases, if you have uh, other concerns, we may add a trust in there. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, we've talked about the five documents and it, this leads right into our, our poll question. I know that we're running close on time. We did start a little bit late, um, but I just wanted to, we wanted to see again, um, as we discussed, as Aaron and Dan discussed the five documents, right now where you currently are, what are, um, your, you know, where are you most concerned? Are you concerned about, are you here and, you, and on the call and you have concerns about your young children? Or again, perhaps it's young children of a friend or family member, again, not necessarily yourself, but um, perhaps you have an, a college bound student or you're concerned about your aging parent, perhaps your spouse or your partner. And then lastly, the um, option is you're concerned about yourself. So um, I'll give it a, just another couple of seconds as people are continuing to, to vote. And same thing as the last one that, um, you can put down multiple, you know, as I mentioned at the earlier the call, I had concerns about myself, I had concerns about my, uh, my child, and I have concerns about my parents. So this, I was like, yeah, I need to talk to you guys. <laughs> There's a whole lot of stuff going on. So um, looks like almost everyone has voted. Again, appreciate the insights. I'll go ahead and close it. We'll share the results. And very much like the last time, we have a pretty nice, you know, um, a lot of folks are just interested, very curious about everything. And, and, and I think rightfully so, we talked about just what a, what a difficult time these last couple months have been. And it's really shed light on areas that we always think, right, that you have, we always have time. And sometimes that, that, that's just not the case. It really is, um, we wanna make sure that we have everything in place to protect not only ourselves, but then also our loved ones so that they are not um, put in the position where it's already a stressful time that they're gonna be navigating. And we wanna take that stress off of, off of their shoulders and, um, and by following these, you know, these, these great foundation documents, um, Aaron and Dan can help you do that. And one of the, um, I just wanna go into another question. Uh, one of the questions, uh, I'm just going to throw up the uh, contact information. So if you have a question for Aaron or Dan, uh, you can go ahead and email them at, you'll see here at info at uh, And we can also, you can call them. You can visit their website. It's a very informative website. Uh, it's fantastic. A lot of great information. On that website, you can also find that there's a place that you can request a consultation um, where you can ask additional questions, whether it's on something that they covered today or something else that's on your mind. You can sign up for their newsletter and you can uh, read really great articles from the blogs. You can request a free copy of their community resource guide, and then also find additional helpful information on the subjects of estate planning and elder law. And um, Aaron and Dan, another question that came out while I was uh, reviewing this information was, are you able um, to use, are they able to use your firm if, you're, if their legal residence is out of the state? Uh, the short answer is no. If you're a legal resident of another state, we're probably going to recommend that you speak to an attorney in that state. There are some exceptions like I'm a Florida resident, but I know if I need long term care, it's going to be here in Massachusetts because all of my kids are in Massachusetts and I want to be near them um, if that happens. So in that case, we'll, we will want to tap into Mass Health or Massachusetts Medicaid, and you should see a Massachusetts attorney. But the, the sort of the general rule is see an attorney in your state. Now, especially in, in this area, we do have a lot of folks that have homes in two different states. Um, so if, they're, if they have residency in two states, again, say Florida and Mass, how do you navigate that? Same analysis. If their primary okay. residence is Florida, then they should probably see a Florida attorney. Um, and there can be exceptions, you know, we can, um, depending on the goals, but for long-term care, you want to see an attorney in the state that you want your long-term care in. You know, if you, if you start needing help, you may come back, you may intend to come back to Massachusetts, then you should see an attorney up here. Even if you sort of have uh, spent some time in both states, Mo most people do. My parents do and, and uh, you know, spend a few months in Florida every year. Now, now, Dan, with that, so if it's, if you're not planning, if you're, say, 
perhaps um, just one of the examples, you know, it's your, your concern, you want to set yourself up for yourself, you're in your, you know, say your 20s, 30s, um, you want to go ahead and just make sure you have your ducks in a row. Um, I think as, you know, Aaron, um, I mentioned, like, sometimes you may just, unfortunately, right, it's unfortunate, you may be in a car accident, and now you have these documents. Um, so same thing, I don't mean to belabor the, the question, but just to be very clear, so it's, even if you have dual residency, it's based out of your primary, or again, just, just go ahead and give a call and, and you guys can talk it through. Um, I would go with the attorney in the state that I lived in most. Usually, usually a document, if, if valid in the state in which it was drafted, like a healthcare proxy will be, that's the rule in Massachusetts, it'll be accepted here if it was valid in Florida when you drafted it there. So that's okay. If you're doing more complex uh, planning than foundational documents, give us a call and we'll walk you through the considerations of which state. Okay, all right. And I said, yep, I would absolutely, uh, I encourage everybody to take advantage of um, the information that's up on the screen right now. You can have the consultation with Dan or Aaron or another one of the members of their firm. Um, as we see, they're very, very knowledgeable um, and obviously with the, with the situation that we're in, very flexible with whether Aaron mentioned early on in the call that they can come to you um, or if you wanna to come to one of their three locations, um, they are following all the strict guidelines, uh, keeping your health and the health of themselves and their staff um, you know, uh, front of mind. So um, thank you for joining us. I think that is, if there's any other questions, I know we're coming right up on our time. I don't want to keep everybody, but um, got some feedback. Thank you. Um, they are absolutely um, got some really great feedback, Dan and Aaron. Uh, people are very appreciative of your time. Um, this was great. I really appreciate everyone's engagement. Glad that we were able to help you um, with these questions. And we're running a little bit short on time. If anyone just wants to hold on for one more second, if I could squeeze in one more question. Um, Right now, I just want to see, because again, thank you for all the um, information if you're still on and say, um, if there are any other areas of the law that you would like to see another one of these webinars, feel free to go ahead and let us know if any of these um, topics such as uh, asset protection, including protecting family assets, assets during a child's divorce. Dan talked a little bit about that. Uh, long-term care planning, tax minimization planning, and special needs planning. And uh, I think we're just about there. And I'll share that with the audience again. So really resounding, we see um, between tax minimization and asset protection. So um, thank you for sharing that. And we'll, I'll def we'll definitely share that with the rest of the firm. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see these guys online again soon. So um, I think that's it. If there's anything, Dan or Aaron, if there's anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you, Karen, for your time today. And if anybody has more questions, they can always contact our office. Thanks a lot for doing right. this. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a really nice night. We'll, hopefully we'll be seeing you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.